finally, after months of waiting, here it is. Jim Henson's Creature Shop Animatronics. These will be a series of videos where we'll cover several animatronics and puppets made by the amazing Creature Shop. This video was suggested by Salmation Jimmy via Instagram, so keep your suggestions coming, Duck Squad. We love hearing from you. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram. Fast, fast, fast. Labyrinth Hoggle Jim Henson's and George Lucas's Labyrinth might be a much-loved film nowadays, but it was not appreciated at all at the time. When the film debuted in 1986, it had a poor performance at the box office. Fortunately, people have learned to appreciate it, and the film has won a great following. Labyrinth has a great story, fantastic events, and incredible characters. Who can forget the Goblin King, played by David Bowie, or Sarah, played by Jennifer Connelly, and, of course, the endless number of creatures that appear throughout the movie. Among these creatures is Hoggle, a dwarf who becomes a loyal friend of Sarah's after he defies his master, Jareth, to accompany her on her quest. Hoggle was voiced by Brian Henson and performed by Sherry Weiser, and he was, of course, an animatronic suit. This animatronic was the most advanced animatronic created by the Jim Henson Creature Shop at the time, Time, and it was also the most technologically elaborate, having 18 electric motors. Controlling Hoggle was a challenge that required five performers. The first of these performers was Sherry Weiser, who was inside the suit coordinating all of the characters' body movements. The other four puppeteers controlled all of the facial structures remotely. But of course, five performers trying to get one character out of one puppet was a very tough thing. So basically what it takes is a lot of rehearsing and getting to know each other so that they could be perfectly in sync. Not only is controlling the animatronic hard, but also interacting with it can be a challenge. At the early stages of filming, stars Connolly and Bowie found it difficult to interact naturally with the puppets they shared most of their scenes with, mainly because what they say doesn't come from their mouths, but from the side of the set. But by the end of the film, it wasn't a challenge anymore. Jim Henson knew that Hoggle was their most complex character, so he really wanted him to be a big part of the film and that was why he became such an important supporting character in the end. Now, it is practically a policy in the Jim Henson Creature Shop that all or at least most of the costumes, props, and animatronics are sent back to the shop after they're done with the production photo shoots and public appearances. The Henson family attempts to archive all of its puppets and animatronics, and it is very rare for one to be out of the family's collection. So, it stands to reason that one of their most advanced animatronics would be archived in the Creature Shop, right? Well, that's not the case with Hoggle. After production wrapped, the Labyrinth crew packed up the Hoggle puppet and shipped it off, but for whatever reason, it got lost during the flight, and for a while, it remained abandoned, but thankfully made its way to the Unclaimed Baggage Center in Scottsboro, Alabama. This store purchases unclaimed bags after the airline search 90 days for the original owner and then resells their contents. And they obtained Hoggle the same way they get all these lost luggage items that are for sale in the store, but staff knew that they had found something special. So they made Hoggle a permanent part of their museum. Staff says that they have heard from the Henson Production Company a handful of times over the years since they've had Hoggle, but they just want to make sure that he's well taken care of, which he is, because the owners even had a master doll repair him, and now he is completely restored and displayed front and center in the Alabama store. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 Ninja Turtles Suit Animatronics Let's go back to the 80s and 90s, when the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ruled the world. These characters, created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, were so popular that they could be found everywhere, from toys to animated series, video games, costumes, and of course, movies. In March of 1990, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live-action film debuted. This movie was a huge box office success, being the highest-grossing independent film up to that time. And a big part of the success was due to the work that the Jim Henson Creature Shop did on the Turtles. They were in charge of bringing Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo to life. These suits were created in the North London Creature Shop, which was open from 1978 to 2005. To create these suits, the performers were first chosen. Then, a very accurate life cast was created out of these performers and made them into fiberglass molds. The design of the turtles was made out of clay and made to fit the cast shape. And finally, the latex parts were produced. To create the animatronic heads, a frame made out of fiberglass was made and then multiple servo motors were integrated to be able to create the many facial expressions. These masks were some of the most advanced animatronic masks at the time. 
This head full of servos was capable of emulating an endless number of human expressions and was worn just like a helmet. The battery that powered the motors was hidden in the shell. This allowed the actor to have maximum freedom of movement and comfort. The facial expressions were controlled remotely by a puppeteer with a special hand control full of different buttons. This control allowed the puppeteer to create all types of different expressions on the animatronic. The expressions were programmed by computer. Thanks to the many servos, expressions like anger or happiness could be recreated on the helmet. And not only that, but micro expressions, like the eyebrow movement or the character's blinks. One of the animatronic's more impressive functions was the lip sync. This function worked through an infrared sensor that detected the shape of the puppeteer's mouth remotely and then emulated it on the animatronic head in real time. As we said before, doing a credible interpretation is such a challenge because the suit performer and the animatronic puppeteer have to be completely in sync so they can combine the face and the body movements perfectly. These animatronic suits were very impressive, but what happened to them after they were used for the film? Fortunately, several of the costumes were saved and remain in perfect condition. One of the Leonardo suits was saved for Kevin Eastman, co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, after the production of the film was done. He has kept it ever since and even restored it recently with the help of Tom Spina Designs. He then gave fans the chance to bid on the fully restored Leonardo movie prop costume through Prop Store's Entertainment Memorabilia Auction on September 27, 2016. The restored Ninja Turtle costume sold for a little over $12,000. So there was a happy ending for these suits. Country Bear Movie Bears Way before Disney began turning their most iconic animated movies into live action, they began making movies based on their most famous attractions. This trend started with the Tower of Terror movie in 1997, then Mission to Mars in 2000, and continued with the Country Bear Jamboree movie in 2002. This film is a satire of behind-the-music rock and roll bands. Barry, a young bear raised by a human family, attempts to trace his roots. He meets up with the Country Bears, a long-since broken-up band, and he helps them reunite for one final concert while searching for who he truly is. The Country Bears was not well received by the public, but we can't deny that the work put into the bear animatronics is great. And of course, it is because these animatronics were made by Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Actually, according to many reviews, the only reason the movie is worth watching is because of the animatronics and the way these expert puppeteers and voice actors made the bears come alive. Disney contacted Jim Henson's Creature Shop so they could create the bears for the film, and the suit performers were selected and brought in for measurements and body casting. It is very important to do this because this ensures a good costume fit, which helps the suit performer do a good job on the creature's movements. The bears were animatronic suits, which is a mixture between a basic creature suit and an animatronic, controlled by a puppeteer with a remote control. There is so much teamwork needed between the suit performer and puppeteer to control these animatronics because they need to be completely in sync with each other. Two performers were assigned to each character, so each bear has a suit performer and a facial puppeteer. The first thing the suit performer does is to become familiar with their costume. Then the puppeteer begins by programming the face. That entails creating various facial expressions and attenuating each servo in the head to a button on the joystick and jaw of the Big One system designed by the Jim Henson Company. Also, unlike animated projects where the voices are recorded first, here the puppeteers worked closely with the director, and it was their voices that were captured during the entire shoot as they operated the animatronic heads. This gave the bears the ability to improv and be directed as on-set performers. The stars' voices were recorded later. The animatronic suits were not only used for the movie, but also at the movie's premiere, where the bears performed a live rock concert at El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. And for a limited run, they performed before showings of the film. This was done to a pre-recorded track with animatronic puppeteers operating the faces on the side of the stage. This film might not be the best attraction-inspired movie Disney has ever done, or even a good one, but it's definitely worth watching at least once. You can watch it on Disney+. Plus. Muppet Christmas Carol, Ghost of Christmas Present A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens is one of the most iconic Christmas novels ever made. So iconic that it has been recreated millions of times. One of these is The Muppet Christmas Carol, which came out in 1992. This was the first Muppet movie made without Jim Henson, who had sadly passed away two years earlier. The film was directed by Brian Henson, Jim Henson's son. He was 28 at the time and terrified of directing. He even begged other people to direct, but he ended up doing a fantastic job. When the team was working on the script, they wanted to do a complete parody, but then they thought of something more interesting. 
Nobody had ever captured the wonderful way Dickens described the scenes in his novel, so they decided to have Charles Dickens narrating the movie. And who would be better to play him than Gonzo? The film sets were pretty tricky because they were built to accommodate the Muppeteers, so they were elevated to leave room for them to walk around. Planks and platforms were put in place for Michael Caine, who played Scrooge, and his human co-stars to walk on. You can see how crucial, careful foot placement was as the Muppets swarmed him singing the opening song Scrooge. As you can see, this film was really ambitious, and there were many unique details while filming it. Each of the three Ghosts of Christmas was pretty challenging, but the results were remarkable. The Ghost of Christmas Past has an eerie, floating physicality. To be able to achieve this look, Muppeteers were submerged in a tank of baby oil backed by a green screen to record the performance. This proved to be expensive and challenging to to keep clean, so they had to switch to water. Though the Rod Puppet's glues and paints interacted poorly with the water, they got the shots they needed, and the scenes were a success. But the most complex of all the spirits was the Ghost of Christmas Present. He was part puppet, part animatronic, and part actor. The puppet was created so a full-sized man could fit inside, but across the room, Jerry Nelson performed the character's voice and expressions using a remote control. This was pretty challenging because two people brought the same character to life, so they had to be perfectly synced. It is incredible that they put so much work into this character, and it worked, because he's such a lovable and cute ghost. Who does your hair? <laughs> <laughs> One Hundred and One Dalmatians Animals One Hundred and One Dalmatians is a huge classic, and so in 1996, Disney decided to create a live-action remake of it. The movie sadly did not have a great reception with critics, and it was also very controversial because many irresponsible people watched the movie, bought Dalmatian puppies right after, and then when they grew tired, abandoned them. But despite these dilemmas, we can't deny the huge work that everybody who worked on the project did. Glenn Close as Cruella was terrific and terrifying at the same time. But the best part of this remake was able to be done because of the enormous talent of Industrial Light and & Magic and Jim Henson's Creature Shop, who created effects and animatronics for the film. John Hughes and Stephen Herrick's intention was to use real animals to make 101 Dalmatians, and they did. However, there are some shots and scenes which would not have been possible without the wizardry of these studios. Jim Henson's Creature Shop was commissioned to produce a range of young and newborn animatronic puppies. Other animatronic creations include the back end of a horse used to catapult Cruella through a barn door, an Airedale dog, a dead tiger, and a raccoon and pig. Industrial Light and & Magic added puppies to scenes to give the illusion of 99 puppies fleeing from Horace and Jasper as well as digitally renovating the DeVille Mansion and multiplying Pongo and Purdy's puppies to give the illusion of 1,000 puppies. To promote the movie, Disney recreated the creature shop inside the now-retired backstage pass attraction at Disney's Hollywood Studios, and they brought these animatronics so guests could see them and interact with them. These animatronics were so cute, and we would love to see them back at the parks for a 101 Dalmatians attraction. Which animatronics would you like to see in part 2 of this series? Let us know in the comments! Meanwhile, if you want to plan your next Disney vacation and experience a Jim Henson attraction like Muppet Vision 3D, our friends at PixieVacations.com can help you plan your perfect vacation to Disneyland, Disney World, or a Disney cruise specifically tailored to your vacation style and budget. And working with a Pixie is completely free, so talk with them to make the best out of your Disney vacation.